Okay, hello traders. It's Friday, July the 29th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your FX market wrap-up for this past 24 hours of trade, as well as announce what we can expect in these final 24 hours of the trading week and the trading month. Well, of course, what we just passed through was a period, I think, of uh, quiet a transitional period between two very prominent pieces or uh, groups of event risk, obviously. Wednesday was the FOMC rate decision, UK GDP. Very intense, very uh, speculative in its intensity. Uh, and the upcoming session is just absolutely loaded with event risk. Now, this burdensome, uh, very uh, concerning mixture of high-profile event risk is leading some to be very anxious, and others to be relatively sanguine, perhaps I think a little overconfident and thereby complacent. We should be certainly on uh, alert. It's always better to be cautious and prepared when big market moves arise, especially when there seems to be a high probability of uh, one uh, a big swell actually coming. Now, when uh, big moves result from little warning, there's not much we can do. All right, we have to give that a pass and keep moving. But in these instances, we should be cautious, we should be on guard, and not just avoiding risk at all cost, but also preparing ourselves for opportunities as they arise. Now, across the various asset classes, we have different states of readiness. Uh, the S&P 500 that you see here, it continues to carve out consolidation, sideways price action, uh, with a, a remarkably tight range. I've been keeping a close eye on the uh, activity, the volatility, in the ATR, the average true range. Uh, you can see the five-day, which is the red, is at an exceptionally low level. Uh, such low levels have uh, actually been uh, precedent for a sudden change or a remarkable change to more active markets with big moves. I wouldn't be too surprised, I think most of us, if we have a technical uh, orientation at all, would recognize this as consolidation in an otherwise very active market and is quite prone to breakout. But there are assets like this that don't show uh, much uh, intensity, at least exhibiting outright, uh, at all. Even volatility, all right, let's uh, zoom in on this. Even implied or expected volatility for the FX, uh, for the uh, S&P 500 is low. Still below 14, uh, we've been below 14 uh, for the past three weeks. That is an exceptionally low level of volatility, all right, anticipated volatility. So this is remarkable. This puts me at, uh, in a very uh, uneasy situ uh, position. I don't think that this represents calm at all. When you're at calm at record highs, when uh, there's such uh, epic debate about what the value is and where the dependency is, whether it's GDP, whether it's uh, businesses uh, growing, whether it's consumer spending, or whether it's central banks keeping a firm foundation underneath this, this is not a time to be complacent. And I watch this explicitly because it represents or reflects my interest in the, in the market's interests and concerns in risk trends. Here's my comparison of all the or not all of them, but a, a variety of uh, very clear risk-oriented assets. And you can see that the S&P 500, the blue line, champions them all. So worth looking to see how the best of the group is doing, as well as the worst of the group, commodities here, as well as the dispersion, the intensity, and all the other statistics. But the S&P 500 is certainly a good uh, barometric pressure to say there's a certain degree of complacency here. And when I take stock of the event risk that we are facing ahead, it's probably not a good uh, time to be complacent. Right, we have such high profile event risk. Risk trends is something that I always keep in mind. And it's certainly something that I want to be uh, clued into. Now, my traditional view of risk trends is expressed uh, on the dollar yen or other yen crosses. That's not going to be a very uh, opportune uh, wait and see kind of currency or currency cross. 
into the uh, final 24 hours of this trading week. Why? Because we have the BOJ rate decision. That is just going to overwhelm almost everything. So that is where the focus has to be turned. And we know the yen is uh, certainly a comparison of uh, monetary policy, and on the opposite end, it also has its connections to risk trends. You're never going to get rid of risk trends. It is a uh, elemental universal force. But it can certainly be distracted by such an intense piece of event risk as this upcoming BOJ rate decision. So where do I look for a more reserved uh, risk orientation? It's not, that's not actually an easy question. I actually like the Aussie USD and the Kiwi USD, the more traditional risk-oriented uh, currencies, the high-yield currencies, if you will. And that does present uh, similar opportunities for the likes of, uh, let's say, a pound CAD or a pound Kiwi or a pound Aussie. Pound Kiwi has some very uh, interesting long-term technicals, but I always been, I've always been looking at this for a long-term perspective, less of the short-term, and it's been carving out some interesting short-term activity, so I'll keep this in mind as well for a short-term. Uh, pound CAD, which I've uh, associated to oil, uh, much like the Euro CAD, whose break has been uh, such a problem, and even the uh, Dollar CAD, whose break had stalled out almost immediately, despite the fact it had a wedge break. You could say that maybe it was the 200-day moving average that scared off uh, any uh, errant bulls. But it's really a lack of conviction through the fundamental backdrop, and it needs risk appetite. And I think that these are more effective at accomplishing it. Uh, maybe add Euro Aussie to this collection as well. Now the Euro is not necessarily a very good safe haven, nor is the British pound with Brexit hanging on its head, but uh, lack of options uh, would certainly uh, generate a considerable interest in these more traditional uh, outlets for the, the risk on risk off element. And then when you get into greater complications, uh, they kind of dissipate a little bit. All right, so I'll be watching those in particular. Now, alternative to the S&P 500 and the risk theme that it represents, you have others that were very active. Uh, the post fomc generated some tremendous volatility for the U.S. dollar, but it was kind of like uh, lightning in a bottle uh, or a storm in a teacup. It doesn't really, it, it's really aggressive, a lot of activity, a lot of uh, a, a, a significant showing, but not a lot of conviction and follow through. Two massive dojis back to back going in opposite directions. It couldn't, couldn't be more explicit in its lack of, uh, of definable or discernible direction. Now that puts at risk something like the Euro USD, which I, wa I was watching around the 200-day moving average. We broke uh, w and came right back down, creating a tail. No conviction there, which is, I mean, that could be the subtitle of the Euro USD's life over the past uh, months. Uh, the pound dollar would have a sudden stall in what was tentatively a short-term wedge formation here, so undermining that technical pattern. We do still have some range of highs here. So keeping a, an eye on the short terms. Uh, this is more of a dollar-oriented currency specifically, uh, but anything dollar you also have to be very uh, cautious of. We looked at the Kiwi dollar, the Aussie dollar, and the, uh, also the uh, dollar yen. I think it's worth uh, highlighting the dollar Swiss. Uh, typically, I say that this is just a inflection of the Euro USD, but the Swiss franc is increasingly doing more of its own thing. So I'm going to start treating it a little bit more independently of that evaluation. And there are some interesting technicals that are going on. We did break the 200-day moving average here, and it seems to be holding. So that's interesting. All right. And if, as long as it doesn't have a, an immediate connection to uh, the euro, it might be able to provide a little bit more of an independent opportunity. Now, extreme volatility, uh, but with no conviction. Uh, a big, big contrast to the S&P 500. But then we also have no... Uh, no volatility, no discernible act activity, or at least not extreme, but we have extreme conviction. At least from the yen's perspective, extreme conviction that there's going to be volatility, that there is going to be a huge move. And we get that from the upcoming BOJ rate decision, which we've been you know, giving ample warning about this entire week. It comes up in this Asia session, and 
no specific time release. People always ask me what time does it come out. I, uh, they don't and give us a specific time. But we know that implied volatility or expected volatility is extreme. We've been looking at the one week, all right? And that has hit a seven and a half year high, the highest since the great financial crisis, because one week and in one week's time frame, it actually incorporates that BOJ rate decision. Well, now, uh, since we are less than a day away, we finally incorporate the overnight implied volatility. And to give you some scale, here in the green is Brexit, or the pound dollar implied volatility going into the Brexit vote versus the BOJ expectations. The dollar yen implied volatility overnight is 53%. Extreme, very extreme. Pound dollar's implied volatility overnight was just north of 70. So there is still a, a, a hefty premium uh, over pound dollar implied volatility, but this is comparable, all right, quite extreme. I wouldn't call it necessarily a possible Brexit kind of fallout, but it's going to carry some very significant implications of potential volatility. And what makes it more complicated is that the market anticipates so much that if they don't act, you get volatility. Dollar yen and the other yen crosses will drop. If they do act, we will have volatility because you'll have uh, likely a tentative advance. Uh, follow through, however, whether it's immediate uh, or immediately lost or it has some consistency is about how much conviction there is in the effort that they make. Now, obviously, this has a lot of potential to undermine uh, the Bank of Japan and the Japanese, and Japanese government's uh, stimulus efforts. Right? Their efforts to try to pursue the objectives they put out, which is a return to inflation, uh, a return to stable, uh, positive growth. But my greater concern, and obviously there's a lot of opportunity here, uh, if they don't act, that's a short-term volatile move to the downside for these yen crosses. Uh, you can find a lot of uh, yen-based crosses that will present opportunity on a technical basis for that particular view. I will be uh, quite interested in Aussie yen and Kiwi yen given their carry trade status and the dollar yen as it is the second most liquid currency in the world. So that's where I will look for such an outcome. Alternatively, if they do provide stimulus, then we're going to get into a more critical and to some extent global uh, discussion. What is the program? How experimental is it? And more importantly, how successful is it according to the market's interpretation? I have to remind you that the ECB's most recent significant upgrades were met with incredible and immediate skepticism. Euro advanced and the DAX dropped. That is very important to recognize because it already sets the terms, a litmus test, if you will, for global monetary policy that says that extreme programs are not necessarily very effective at devaluing currency and lifting capital markets as they have in past years. If you recall, the U.S. and even the U.K. QE programs were very effective on that. And it wasn't just effective in the U.S. and the U.K., it was effective globally. These efforts, late in the games, potentially, are having less and less impact. So now it's up to the Bank of Japan, who's uh, been put in a very tough position. Now anticipation is so high from the market and the government that they're uh, essentially in a position to be forced to act. Effectively or not, they may be forced to act. If this program, whatever it is, if it does come down the line and the markets voted with a sense of confidence, there is an outlet for other central banks to follow in its wake. ECB and even ones that have been on hold longer, the SMB or the Bank of England, whether it contemplates it's going to do a post-Brexit move, they will have a template, a guideline to say that there is effective efforts that can still be implemented and they have options. If However, it is experimental or it's an expansion of the QQE program or deeper into negative rates. It could be further evidence that monetary policy simply is not going to be able to accomplish what it has in the past. And some of the most important aspects of it uh, for what we see in current markets is it lifts capital markets. When we look at 
something like the comparison of the S&P 500 and the Fed's balance sheet growth or the S&P 500 and global monetary policy growth. We definitely have seen a diminished capacity for lifting the markets even further. All right, uh, a diminishing margin, marginal return and additional stimulus. And that is very disconcerting because we don't have growth that has been very robust. We don't have higher yields that's going to keep investors uh, in their seats. All right, we have monetary policy and confidence in monetary policy. If that confidence wavers, there is a far less stable backdrop for sentiment. So evaluate this uh, BOJ rate decision. You might be watching this video after the BOJ rate decision, but evaluate it uh, for what it means for global efforts, not just for what it means to the Japanese yen, although there is certainly opportunity there. So if we have risk aversion and we have skepticism that the BOJ effort is going to be uh, meaningful uh, for the Japanese yen depreciation, that only doubles up on a downside move in the yen crosses, including for the dollar yen. So suddenly this uh, currency pair looks a lot more attractive uh, now than it has uh, since Brexit. And it goes back to the asymmetry that I talked about uh, back when we were breaking below 116, the fundamental asymmetry where uh, pretty much most of the scenarios had a bearish tone to them or an explicit bearish tone. All right. This is a big picture theme, however. This is not supposed to be played as just a short term. You do not want to just attempt to jump in front of a freight train. There's going to be a lot of volatility here. I like this more from the big picture perspective. Now, the BOJ is not the only event risk on the docket. We have the Swiss National Bank uh, giving its st statistics about uh, its earnings because it is a uh, semi-public uh, or semi-private uh, uh, group. Uh, we also have currency allocations, which is going to be very important to assessing uh, how effective their efforts are at keeping their currency down. And yes, they are still attempting this, and they're not doing very well at it. We're going to have Euro Area GDP, and of course the European Central Bank's bank stress test results. I suspect that the Italian banks are not going to do so well if they are if they are given a clean bill of health expect the markets to be quite uh, upset because they expect this uh, and they would claim uh, something foul. Then we also have the US GDP figures that will round out the week. This is the most uh, this is the largest economy in the world, all right? So its growth is exceptionally important. It is the backbone for expansion especially the US consumer. Recently, we've saw a significant downgrade in growth expectation because of advanced indicators that have come across wires recently. Uh, we also had the Atlanta Fed's GDP uh, forecaster uh, actually drop quite tremendously. So all of a sudden, tensions are starting to rise on the performance of this GDP figure. This is going to definitely have good uh, sway over the dollar, good sway over equity markets and the risk theme that they represent. So keep an eye on things that have a safe haven tally to it, not just dollar, uh, but gold. All right. Look at other uh, risk-oriented assets that might not get in the direct uh, impact, the direct uh, target of risk on, risk off, like oil. All right. Oil is not your traditional risk on, risk off, like an equity market. I'd also keep, uh, say keep an eye open on emerging markets like the dollar czar here. We actually have the czar appreciating, which is unusual for a risk-oriented move in such uncertain times. There's going to be a lot of opportunity here in the majors and in the crosses, but uh, it definitely has to come with a healthy dose of acceptance and appreciation for this event risk that lies ahead. Short-term volatility can be quite high. And while there are some opportunists out there with a very high risk tolerance that will say, these are good trading conditions for me. I'm not that type. I need uh, some greater degree of conviction. I need probability to match potential. All right? I need to have not just a big trade opportunity. I also need to have a good probability that it will play out in my favor. 
if you're trying to find those currencies that get further away from uh, the big picture event risk, I do like the pound CAD, even though as a risk exposure it's not particularly uh, strong. Pound Aussie can also fit that bill, although its technicals are not uh, that uh, convincing. Aussie CAD, I talked about the technical levels there that are actually quite uh, remarkable. Uh, it's just not uh, a favored pair for most people. And I still have that Aussie Kiwi trade. This is a four hour chart. If I go up to, I think, an eight hour chart, you see a little bit better uh, the consolidation that we are trying to break down from. And this is not uh, motivated by uh, any major event risk, in the, at least in the past 24 hours or last 24 hours of this week. The big stuff for Aussie and Kiwi uh, lie ahead. But we'll save that for tomorrow when we talk about the top event risk for the week ahead. All right. Until then, we'll wrap it up here. I hope you remain cautious and vigilant on the event risk that's coming up. There's a lot of it. Uh, and until we speak again tomorrow, I wish you good luck trading out there.